So welcome everybody to our session with my very good friend, Keith. He's playing with his computer. He was always playing when we were in school. Um, <laughs> that's why I like him so much because I'm also in the yellow happiness bucket. We both wanna have fun in life. And a fun fact about Keith is that he introduced me to Adventure Nannies because he was building their website because they're really good friends with the founders. And I'm like, oh, Adventure Nannies, that's a cool name. And then those are really cool people. So that was like way back in, I don't know, maybe five years ago, six years ago, Keith, when we started yeah. EMP. EMP is Entrepreneurs, Entrepreneurial Masters Program at MIT in Boston and a crazy group of 60 entrepreneurs from around the world. I think we were like 30 plus countries got together for a three-year master's program. Um, and the saying is that this program happens every year for three years. And out of each class, there's one billionaire. And my finger is on key. <laughs> <laughs> I am actually behind. I have multiple forum mates from that. I think half of my forum is going to get there. I think we're going to have about six from our class. It's incredible. That are going to be billionaires. Yes. Right? So buckle up, guys. I was also in this class. I just had a little detour. Two years COVID. <laughs> we're going. <laughs> so... Thank you so much, Keith, for bringing all your wisdom for the last, I don't know, you're not that old yet. You're my age, I think. <laughs> um, I am old. Over your lifetime, Keith is an incredible human being. He's not just a very successful entrepreneur. He's also a very kind man with a big heart who absolutely is in line with our core vision and mission to empower everybody we work with to reach, to help them reach their full potential. And today he will share his wisdom and get us going in how do we use the different things that are out there in a systematic and repeatable way. Heather, where's Heather? Where did you go? She was here a second ago. So because we are on this journey to not just becoming the best service organization in the world, we're also on the journey for each individual person here to become the best version of ourselves. And with that, I would like to hand it over to Keith and say, thank you for making the time early in the morning. I know you just got back from Europe. You're in New York right now. Um, you're originally from Colorado and we do love to smoke weed. Um, <laughs> anything else? Uh, yeah. I should have changed the slide for you. I'll, I'll, I'll note the comment. I had to change the slide where I mentioned weed because I present a place that was very conservative, but I'll give you the real slide. Um, and yes, the other things that I'll, We're that real I'll people share. Here. We're dealing with the real world. <laughs> the real world. I love it. I don't know if you remember this, Susan, but at the end of year one, our facilitator's name is Curly. He said that I think 50% of you are going to leave this presentation and you're going to forget everything you've learned. And then maybe 30 or 40% of you are going to take little bits and pieces back to you, but less than 10% of you are going to take everything that we've learned and actually implement it in your life. And the mm -hmm. things that we were taught were truly life-changing. I've never been in a room where, you know, with 68 people, a small classroom, the presenters had everybody in tears. The presenters all got standing ovations. It was truly incredible. And so I left there thinking that that would be truly tragic. And so some of you have already received the Oak Journal. Those of you that don't have the Oak Journal, just use a blank piece of paper for this presentation. Your journal is on the way to you. But that journal is actually distilled down all of the learnings from that EMP program and then my journey as an entrepreneur into a toolkit that you can use to live your best life, to reach your full potential. And I want to start the presentation with this number. One in 400 trillion is the statistical probability that you have a life, that you exist. This number is not made up. I used to run a creative agency called Zen Man. That's when I was doing the Adventure Nannies work. I ran it for 20 years. And when I was running that agency, I used to have a saying, if we have facts, we'll use facts. If we have opinions, we'll just use mine. Not necessarily the best leadership saying, but uh, that's what I used to say. This is not my opinion. This is a statistical fact. The science behind this number is, the average sperm a man will produce in his lifetime times the number of eggs the average woman is born with is one in 400 trillion. 
So that does not even factor in that there were probably 6 billion people wandering around this rock that had to come together to give your parents that chance. And I'm sorry to start your morning with you visualizing your parents conceiving you, but <laughs> one in 400 trillion chance of you being here. So really, really, really take that number moving forward because this gift is a life not to be wasted. And I want you to imagine from this day forward, your last day on earth, the person you became will meet the person you could have become. I'll say that again because it's so important. The last day on earth, you will meet the person you could have become. And this was the weed slide I had to change. I, I would normally say, and I didn't want to be this guy staring back at somebody that could have had a big impact on the world. I had to change it. It usually said my hobbies are smoking a shit ton of weed and rescuing stray dogs. Clearly, that's a goat. Um, I just spoke at a Christian conference and they asked me to change it to underwater basket weaving. So <laughs> how did I not end up being this David Duchovny weed smoking goat herder is a magical Japanese word. It's called Ikigai. If you are not familiar with Ikigai, this term trains my life. Ikigai translates in English to life's purpose or your reason for being. It sits at the center of what you love, what the world needs, what you can be paid for and what you're good at. Susan, you're probably a good example. You do something that you're passionate about, that the world needs, but hey, you can be paid for it. You are good at it. It is absolutely okay to be compensated. Unfortunately, most people live in that profession or vacation. It's what they're good. It's what they could be paid for. And some people live in that passion or mission, what they love, what the world needs, a Mother Teresa, Jane Goodall, but it is absolutely possible to give the world what it needs and to make a comfortable living. Actually, in Okinawa, they attribute their population of senatorians. A senatorian is somebody who lives to be over 100 years old. And Okinawa has the highest concentration of senatorians anywhere on the planet. And it's not the rice. It's not what they eat. It's not the fish. It's people finding their ikigai. When you find your ikigai, it's not that you are you know, waiting till Friday. I mean, I just got back from a week in Europe, um, haven't hardly slept, and I was very excited to wake up early and do this presentation for you because this is my reason for being. This is my life's purpose. My why is through science, spirituality, and generosity to help others be the best version of themselves. My agency was called Zen Man because I'm Buddhist. My goal in this life is to be a bodhisattva. Bodhisattva is a Buddhist whose uh, purpose in this incarnation is to help others reach their full potential. So we're going to help you find your ikigai. And on this path, this is not, you know, we've got an hour, hour and a half presentation. Uh, I want to set realistic expectations. There's not going to be this light that shines down like John Belushi and the Blues Brothers and you start doing cartwheels and you know exactly your life's purpose. This is the first step on that path. I left no stone unturned looking for my ikigai. That's multiple trips to Burning Man with Susan, uh, plant medicine ceremonies in the Amazon jungle, you know, Machu Picchu. I mean, it truly left no stone unturned. Remember that first slide, one in 400 trillion. It is worth it in this life to seek out your potential. We actually have a false blue zone here in Colorado. We have a blue zone as people that live, uh, live to be very, very old. It's a high density of them but it's a false blue zone. Unlike Okinawa, our blue zone here in Colorado is an Eagle Vale, and it's really wealthy, affluent, active people that move to Eagle Vale from all over the world to live out their active lifestyle. So it's, it's a little bit of a, a false blue zone because these people that are living that life move to this area, whereas in Okinawa, this is just in their culture. You might be more familiar in the West with what, what is why. Simon Sinek made it very famous, start with why. Um, and I bet you know your why at your organization, but how many of you understand your personal why? And there's a formula to that, and I shared mine with you through science and spirituality and generosity to help others be the best version of themselves. So your why, while you're thinking about it today, this week, over the next several months, even the rest of the next upcoming year, 2023, just fill in those blanks. What is the contribution that you make and what is the impact that you are going to have on the world? Remember, one in 400 trillion. Now, some of you, if you're in the US, have already received your Oak Journal. If you were international, I know there's 11 countries of people here. So some of you still have that in the mail on its way to you. If you have your Oak Journal, take it out. If you don't have your Oak Journal, take out any piece of paper. We're going to do some writing. The reason that I created a journal, even though I owned a digital agency, one of the top digital agencies in the world, you'd think I would create an app. The reason that I created a journal is twofold, and they're actually interconnected. The reason is when you write something down, you double the probability of accomplishing it. 
If you want to win the Nobel Prize, writing that down, you've just doubled the probability of accomplishing it. They have done studies where people write their goals December 31st on a piece of paper, put them in an envelope, seal that envelope, put it in a safe, and don't open it for an entire year. And on average, over 60% of the things that they write down, their goals will have come to fruition. It is very, very powerful. And the reason, the second part of this, the reason why that, why that is so powerful, there is emotion that is transferred when you put pen to paper. And I can prove this to you. Those of you that have children, and I'm one of them, uh, I don't know how many of you collect, but I have every drawing my kids have ever done. When I ask, what does dad want for Christmas? I want artwork that my kids created. It's framed all over my house like a Picasso. It is worthless to anybody else than me. But to me, it is truly priceless. And the reason that that is, is there was love that was transferred when they put that pen or crayon or, or paintbrush to paper. So I actually feel that love that was transferred from Gavin and Quinn to the art that they create for me. And there's actually a really cool tool that you can do to release anger. It works both ways. You can transfer love, happiness, and you can also release anger. If there's somebody that's wronged you, I want you to write a letter to that person. Say somebody um, stole, from, stole from you, roommate stole from you. You can write a letter to that person. You know, Bill, I can't believe you were such a bleep, bleep, bleep. Uh, don't worry about spelling, punctuation, grammar. Feel free to use as much profanity as you want. Nobody is going to read this letter. But you need to get all that emotion that you're feeling transferred onto that page. And then this is an essential step. After you've done that, you burn that letter. And a magical thing happens. Some of that anger is actually going to go up in flames when you watch that page burn. Wait one week and then write a letter to the same person. And depending on the severity of the transgression, after two letters, three letters, eight letters, the final letter that you write, you will have released all of that anger and would actually be a letter that you'd be very proud to share with that person. You know, Bill, I'm very sorry that your family was in a financial situation, that you made that choice, that hurt our friendship. I have compassion for you. Uh, you might even actually want to send that letter to the person. But this exercise is not for Bill. It's not for the person that wronged you. Forgiveness is not for the other person. It's for you. Buddha said, Clinging on to anger is like holding a hot coal, waiting to throw it at your enemy. You are the one that is hurt by holding on to that anger. So releasing that anger, taking that rock out of your backpack is a really, really powerful step. That exercise is actually, um, have you ever, ever had Don Diapani speak in Orange County, Susan? There's a Hindu monk that does some EO talks. He's incredible. And that's a tool that I learned from this incredible uh, Hindu monk, Don Diapani. But we are going to start with an exercise for you called Start Stop. So if you've got your journal, open it up to the back. There's about 50 pages of blank paper. If you don't yet have your oak journal, just grab any piece of paper. Uh, it's got to be handwritten. It can't be typed. That's hence the point of the previous slide. We're going to write this down. And on this piece of paper, whether it's the back of your journal or just any uh, loose leaf paper that you have, on the top left, write the word start. And on the top right, write the word stop. The title of this presentation is Level Up Your Life. My goal as a bodhisattva is to help each of you live your best life to reach your full potential. And to live your best life, there are things that everybody on this call needs to start doing this morning or this evening if you're in Australia, and that you need to stop doing. And we're going to start and stop those things today. So when you write them, if one of the things you want to stop doing is opening you know, a, a second bottle of wine every night with dinner, don't say, I hope to, I'd like to, I will. Be very, very, very intentional with your words. Words matter. So let's take about 90 seconds. I'm not going to call on anybody, so you don't have to share. So please be very, very honest with yourself. This is only for you. What are two to three things that you need to start doing to live your best life? And what are a couple things that you need to stop doing to reach your full potential? Let's write those down. Oh, I'm scrolling through in all of your writing. I love this. The one way I call on people, the only way I call on people is if you're on your phone. You all qualify, except some of you are not on video, but that's okay. It's early. If I wasn't presenting, I would have been in my robe as well.
Give you 30 more seconds, get a couple more thoughts down. Okay, if you did not put these three things under your start list, I want you to add a couple things. The first is mindfulness. The second is your health. And that includes what you put in the bo your body, the fuel, what you put in your body and how you move your body. And then lastly, seven to eight hours of sleep. Mindfulness, some form of meditation is the most common trait in the happiest high-performing humans on this planet. If you do not have a meditation practice, when we finish up the presentation, if we have time, I will teach you transcendental meditation. Um, if you don't think you have time to meditate, you need meditation more than anybody else. When you do your health, when you are eating something, I want you to think about, would myself 10 years from now be happy with the decision that I'm making? So always be thinking that way. And then the sleep. Most of us, are proud that we are deprived of sleep. It's like this badge of honor to how hard we work or how much we are just go, go, go in today's society. But you wouldn't say, be proud that you're taking time off your life or increasing your chance of heart disease or really actually damaging your body. But that's what's happening when we're depriving ourselves of sleep. And how many of you go to bed or wake up like the woman in this stock photo here with a device? a phone, a television, a laptop, a tablet. If you take only one thing away from this presentation, stop doing this. There's several reasons why. I'm gonna give you some of the most important ones. The blue light in this stock photo is intentional. The blue light that our devices emit inhibits your brain's ability to release melatonin, which it needs naturally in our circadian rhythm. Melatonin is what helps us fall asleep, and, and that just happens with the rising and falling of the sun. The devices actually inhibit that. Apple's gotten smart, and some of you are probably thinking, ha, 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 I know I can turn on a filter, and I can filter out that blue light. There's glasses, and there's even devices that can do that. But that does not change the fact that your brain is processing billions of pixels every second, and it is overstimulating. Netflix and chill is an oxymoron. It is not a real thing. That's why that, you know, the one more episode, one more episode, one more episode, that's your brain getting dopamine and it is incredibly unhealthy. I would love for all of you to commit to turning off all devices at least 30 minutes, if not an hour before you go to bed. There's another reason it's going to come into play later in the presentation. The last 10 minutes before you fall asleep and the first 10 minutes after you wake up, your subconscious is very much a sponge. So we can hack what we're putting into your subconscious to help manifest the best possible life that you can have. So the last thing that we want to be doing is looking at social media or CNN or something else that's going to give you, you know, FOMO or stress. And please don't wake up first thing and look at your email. Give yourself 30 minutes to start your day. If you had a brand new um, M5, you would not jump in it, start it and hop on the five and go 90 miles an hour. At least I hope you wouldn't. I hope you could let it, you know, have 30 seconds or a minute to warm up. But the tragedy with that is that car, or whatever you're driving, that is not finite. You can get it fixed. You can buy a new one. You can trade it in, but your body, your brain, this is what you get. You're, you're stuck with this one forever. So let's be very, very intentional with that. And let's start our day with the 10, 10, 10 morning routine. This is so important. It was such a, a game changer. There's a gentleman, Warren Rustan, that presented to me and Susan at MIT, and he taught us the 10, 10, 10 morning routine. It's 10 minutes of meditation, followed by 10 minutes of reading, and then 10 minutes of journaling to start your day. Okay. Journal Warren, or meditation. Warren is a 72 year old billionaire with a massive big family living on a gigantic farm. And he is taking all his wisdom. He's similar like Horst Schultz, but he is working with all the entrepreneurs community in this like massive wisdom that he is like experienced. And oh my God, I really, the 10, 10, 10 made a huge difference in my world. And where's Heather? 
Heather, where are you? <laughs> Heather um, is our strategy are. coach. <laughs> yeah. Um, women of all trades. And she came to your um, presentation, your workshop in Orange County. Ah, so okay. Heather, who is, I really, really appreciate her because she was running merchant acquisition at GE, right? And now she's working here in Apex purpose over profits and helping bringing all her professional knowledge here. And she came to your workshop and the 10, 10, 10 was the most profound thing that she took out of it, that she talks yeah. about almost every single time we're getting together. I'm like, yep. Yep. Yeah. It really yeah. is it's a game changer. And I recommend it to everybody. So full, so full heartedly. And I just want to say thank you for bringing that into my life because it's been, it's been amazing. Oh. You are very welcome, and thank you for the testament. At most times in the presentation right now, there's several people that raise their hand and say, I can't wake up any earlier. You know, I already wake up too early. Um, how do I do the 10, 10, 10? I have a slide later where I'll show you my morning routine that will guilt you into waking up 30 minutes earlier. But let's say you've got a new baby at home or something like that. I don't want you to deprive yourself of sleep. So I want you to work this into your system as to how it could be a part of your morning routine. But I want you to be really authentic with yourself, okay? Uh, walking the dog in the morning is not your meditation, okay? That's not, it's a little bit of exercise, that's good, that's healthy, but that is not meditation. If you are reading your emails or you are reading an industry publication, that is not reading. You don't have to read you know, Jim Collins or uh, you know, Deepak Chopra, but I do want you to read maybe fiction or something other than an industry publication. When you do meditation, meditation gives you a greater sense of self-awareness, reduces stress and anxiety, increases mental clarity and focus, and triggers your brain's relaxation response. A little later in the presentation, we're going to get into the neurochemistry that's happening through all of these things that you're doing. When you read, reading helps you retain information, reduces stress, lowers your risk of Alzheimer's and dementia, and alleviates anxiety and depression. I plan on living to be about 130 years old, finding my icky guy, and I want to make sure that my brain keeps up with my body. And then lastly, why should we journal? Journaling starts your day in a positive way. I don't want you to journal negative thoughts. If you do have one of those days where you have to unload everything, remember that Hindu monk down the Apani and tear that page out of your journal and watch it go up in flames. Journal positive thoughts. Warren would say, imagine that the only legacy your grandchildren will have of you is these journals that they're going to read so be intentional with what you put in your in your journal it also helps you align your intentions improves improves your focus and productivity stimulates creative thought a great book if you haven't read it to put on your reading list is the artist way it's a book about the power of, of just two pages a free flow of consciousness um, journaling every morning journaling doodling uh, there's this tragedy that we have inhibitions that hold us back from doing our most creative work. And this 10 minute flow of consciousness actually gets rid of some of those inhibitions. There's a saying that the most valuable real estate in the world is the cemetery. And that is because of all the businesses that didn't get started, the poems that didn't get written, the books that didn't get created. People were afraid that their best wouldn't be good enough. And so the 10 minute free flow of consciousness actually releases those inhibitions and gets you into that flow state. Now, in this presentation, I'm giving you a ton of tools. I've given you the two most important things. If you take only two things away, 10, 10, 10 morning routine, um, and then morning gratitude, but I'm going to keep going. I'm going to give you a lot of tools. Just stack these one at a time every month, every three months. The whole point of this is to sharpen your saw. Abe Lincoln famously said, if you gave me eight hours to chop down a tree, I would spend six hours sharpening my ax. So this presentation is not about you working harder. It is about you working smarter. And I mentioned I would share my morning routine. So if you wake up at six and you think, ah, there's no way I can wake up at 530, my morning routine starts at 4 a.m. I wake up at 4 a.m. And I drink an 18 ounce glass of lemon water and make a pot of coffee. The lemon water is intentional because when we are sleeping, your body is trying to flush out all the toxins that we've ingested the previous day. And most of us, myself included, start the day with another drug, with caffeine. So take a little bit of time, five minutes, just even while the pot is brewing of coffee or you're making your espresso to drink a warm glass of lemon water. And if you want a little extra credit, put a tablespoon of pink Himalayan sea salt in there. And then the creative writing. I've been working on a novel for two years, and there is a biohack that is truly magical. Between four and five in the morning, 
your brain is already in this state between alpha brain waves and theta brain waves. Alpha brain waves are where an enlightened monk would be in a deep meditation. And theta brain waves are where, where somebody's at when they're in the flow state, whether that's an Olympic athlete performing at their sport or a uh, you know, musician on stage, you know, getting into that state is really hard to do, especially with the distractions that we have in our culture today. So you are naturally in this magical state between four and five in the morning. This is uh, something that I, I probably do 90% of the time. I'm not a masochist. When I finish my book, I'll probably go back to waking up at five, five thirty. But if you want to give this a try to work on a project, it is a game changer. Then I do a little bit different. My 10, 10, 10 is 30, 30, 10. I do 30 minutes of transcendental meditation, again, which I'll teach you that technique at the end. I read for 30 minutes, usually one chapter in two different books, and then I journal for 10 minutes. Do a little bit of yoga, shower, eat breakfast, dress the day, and then make my bed. I go back and work on my book, and then a hack I will teach you called 3210 email. So by 8.35 in the morning, I have actually done more than most people are going to accomplish in the entire day. And most people are just waking up and I feel alive, invigorated, and just ready to crush the day. So if you don't feel like you have 30 minutes in the morning, take a screenshot and guilt yourself into this. This is my morning routine. If you want an accountability partner to get you out of bed, which we're going to talk about later, I will be one of your accountability partners. The first page of the journal has this quote on it. At four o'clock in the morning, when my alarm goes off, I promise you, I am not like, yes, let's get out of bed. It hurts. It's four o'clock in the morning. It's dark outside. The sun hasn't started rising. So your brain naturally doesn't want to get up. And I remember this quote, character is the ability to carry out a good resolution long after the excitement of the moment has passed. When I think about this quote, I pop out of bed. I just ask myself the question, do you have character? And then it's a very, very easy answer. Hell yeah, I have character and I get out of bed. When uh, at the end of every week, you're gonna have a positive psychology exercise. And we're gonna do one of those today to help you create these healthy habits and staying on your track. X is not a singular act, but it's a habit of what we create, what we repeatedly do. There's this misconception that our first responders, our, our military, police, firefighters, our heroes, because they rise to the occasion in a crisis. And they are heroes because they signed up for that job. But in that life-threatening situation, they don't actually rise to the occasion. They default to their training. The reason that they can perform in those life and death situations under that incredible stress is because they have practiced it a thousand times. Your willpower and discipline are no different than any other muscle in your body and then you can build them up and they are going to wear out throughout the day your willpower um, if you are trying to lose weight and you want to be on a diet don't buy that big bag of oreos when you're at the grocery store use your willpower once so you don't have to use your willpower every single time you go in the kitchen and have to say am i going to have some m ms yes or no use your willpower intentionally and then discipline discipline is also a muscle that you can build and we are going to build that muscle with a very simple task over the next 30 days. And that simple task is just making your bed. But when you make your bed every morning, if you haven't done it today, go back and do it. Do it with these three steps. Finish that which you begin. Finish it well beyond your expectations, no matter how long it takes. And do a little bit more than you think you're able to. And if you do this process on that simple task of making your bed, it's going to have momentum that will carry through the rest of the day. It'll be a win that you can build on. It'll also be a choice that you made. I was running late. Did I have time to make my bed? Yes, I, I was committed to myself. I have that discipline. And that is going to carry on and make the rest of your day easier. If you are one of those people that has a partner that is still in bed after you leave for the day, I used to say, just make half the bed. And I got feedback that that's a passive aggressive and not necessarily the best thing for relationships. So don't uh, make your bed with your partner in it, but choose some other task you can, maybe it's just making you and your partner breakfast and then cleaning up the kitchen. Something that takes five minutes or less, but that you can do these three steps. Finish that which you began, finish it well beyond your expectations, no matter how long it takes. This simple thing is a game changer to start your day. Now, we wanna get into setting goals. If you turn to, if you have your journal, turn to, I think it's page 12. I don't know which version. One version doesn't have page numbers, but it's right after the instructions. So there's about six pages of instructions in the beginning. And then there are three goal setting pages. And we're going to set three SMART goals together. SMART goals are specific, measurable, attainable, time-bound, and relevant. 
The journal is a 90-day journal. It's a 13-week journal. Science shows us that humans have no more than a three-month attention span. So the goals that we set, we want to make sure we crush these goals in 90 days. They're accomplishable within 90 days. So if you want to, you know, Susan, if you want to say double revenue, is that a realistic goal to set for three months? No. What's a realistic goal that we could set to Don't do? Tell in them that. <laughs> um, secondly, the goals that we want to set are balanced. You are like a three-legged stool. So we want to set a personal a business or career, and then a relationship or a community goal. So we don't want to just set three business goals. You are going to uh, be a better employee. You're going to be a better partner if you take care of yourself. Susan actually said something to me that changed my life. I don't know if you remember this, Susan, but the 3MP, I was really struggling. And you told me at the end of year two, you have to put your own oxygen mask on first. I was always taking care of others and not taking care of myself. And that saying changed my life. Because so, I have Gabi yeah. on my team, who is a person, I have Lufthansa, who tells every person who gets on the airplane, what do you have to do when we have turbulence? Don't put the thing on your kids. Don't put it on your neighbor. Put it on yourself first until you are safe. And then you can help many, many, many others. So thank you, Gabi. That goes back to you. And yes, Keith, I remember that. Yeah, it changed, Without changed oxygen, my life. There is nothing so. going to happen in your life. It's the breath that's the most important part. Exactly. And that's the really cool thing about this presentation that Susan's bringing it to the organization is we're not just focusing on business goals. We're focusing on you being a well-rounded human. So when you state these goals, there's a specific format. Um, the first is we're going to state your goal. So a goal that I had several years ago, I wanted to do stand-up comedy. When I was in my 20s, I went to a comedy club. At the time, I had bleach white hair like spud or spike in uh, train spotting short hair and sat in the front row and the comedians just needled me they called me q-tip made fun of me the entire time and at the end the final comment called me up on stage and we had this banter back and forth the audience was laughing the afterwards the club owner actually came up to me and said hey you have a gift for for comedy i want to mentor you i'd love for you to do open mics here i'll introduce you to comedians in the circuit that will mentor you um here's my card and what did I do? I think I lost his card on the drive home. It was terrifying. Uh, stand up takes an enormous amount of courage to do. And it terrified me. So I threw that card away. And then several years ago, uh, I had an opportunity through the entrepreneurs organization, again, how I met Susan for a do over. And most of us don't get do overs in life. So when I had that do over to do stand up, I jumped at it. So I stated my goal. I want to uh, fulfill this bucket list of doing stand-up comedy and take advantage of this do-over. How am I going to accomplish that? It's great to set a goal, but you need to have that roadmap. What are the milestones, the resources? How are you going to accomplish this goal? So this is your strategic roadmap to accomplish it. I have to have a location. I don't know how to do stand-up, so I should probably get a professional comedian to coach me. Uh, I have to do 15 minutes. 15 minutes is an eternity in stand-up comedy. Most stand-ups start with two or three minutes when you first start doing open mics. I wanted to do a full set. And then I needed to practice, practice, practice until it was dialed in. And then what was the expected outcome? I would be a better public speaker and complete a lifetime goal of making people laugh doing stand-up. Um, actually, my comedy coach said, first time everybody laughs, it's going to feel like hitting the game-winning shot in the NBA Finals. Um, and he was right. Actually, what was possible after working with him for six months, I did six weeks. I did a 15 minute set at Caroline's, which is the biggest comedy club in the world on Times Square on Broadway. So if I can do stand up, you can accomplish absolutely anything. So let's state your goals. Let's go back and look at that first goal. Think about it and jot down. I won't, we don't have time to do all the tasks and resources to the expected outcomes, but just think for a few minutes about some goals that you're going to set. One personal, one relationship, and one career goal. For the relationship goal, if you are not in a relationship right now, you can pivot that to being a community goal. I don't want you to say, hey, I'm going to find my, my soulmate in the next 90 days. Again, is that an attainable? Is that a realistic goal? But are there things that you could do to put yourself out there? Could you just start down that journey? If you're in a relationship, I think the best first 90-day goal for your relationship is to do something every day that aligns with your partner's love language. If you're not familiar with that book, The Love Languages, I'll give you the, the synapse. You don't need to read it. As humans, we feel love in five different ways. Touch, 
quality time, words of affirmation, gifts, and acts of service. And one of the great tragedies of humankind is you probably feel love completely different than the way your partner feels love. I feel love with touch and words of affirmation, actually holding hands, public displays of affection, intimacy, and my partner telling me that she loves me. Those don't resonate at all with Mindy. <laughs> they have zero effect with her. For Mindy, it is quality time and it's acts of service. If I said I was going to help her do something with her caravan, did I actually do it? Did I spend quality time with her? So understanding your partner's love language is the first step. <clears throat> One of the things that I'll do after this presentation, I'll send this deck to Susan. There's a video I'm going to show you in a few slides. I'll send a link to that video. I'll also send a link to the love languages test. You can take this online test and it'll tell you how you feel love and how your partner feels love. If you already know your partner's love language, and you probably do if you think about it, that's great. The easiest one, you've won the love language lottery, is words of affirmation. If your partner just needs to hear you say, I love you, you've got it so easy. All you have to do is a post-it note, a card, write something in the steam in the mirror, and they are going to feel love. The flip side of that, if your partner's love language is gifts, that doesn't mean they need a new uh, Rolex or car or you know a Mont Blanc pen or something like that every single day. That gift could be a flower that you pick from your own garden, right? It doesn't have to be an expensive gift. So um, figure out your partner's love language. And then a little pro tip here, do not tell them, hey, for the next 90 days, I'm going to do this because the one day you miss, you're going to disappoint them. But just do these things that align with their love language and see how much that changes. Now, every single day after you set your goals, this is the day structure. So a couple of pages after the goal setting is day one of week one. Today is day one of week one. You don't have to wait till January one. You don't have to wait to the first day of a new quarter. Just get started today. And this structure is based on neuroscience to help you get the most benefit and be the most productive. You start the day with gratitude. We share the three things that you're grateful for. And I'm going to share a video after this about the, the magic and the power, the superpower that is gratitude. If you are struggling with something to write that you are grateful for, think about the fact that this morning, a billion people woke up on earth without access to clean drinking water. 700 million people don't even have access to electricity. We are so incredibly blessed. I promise you, no matter what challenge you are facing, there is somebody somewhere in a hospital bed that would chop off their left hand to trade problems with us. Don't repeat the things that you're grateful for. You get diminishing returns in the neuroscience. But the flip side of that coin is the more specific you can be with your gratitude, the more serotonin you're going to get and the reduction in cortisol. One of my favorite gratitudes is an example I have written as number two here is camping at the Crystal Mill with my son, Quinn, parentheses, Stargate. When Quinn and I were camping this summer, we were looking at the stars and my 10 year old said, dad, this is the best moment of my life. And I get a huge flood of oxytocin every time I think about that. But you know what? I've done this 500 times. And I, when I said it now, it's less than when I said it the time before, which is less than the time I said it 100 times ago. The next block is your vision for the day. Ben Franklin, before he got out of bed, every single morning would ask himself the question, what good shall I do this day? And when he went to bed, he would ask that same question, what good do I do this day? He set his intention before his feet touched the floor. So all of you set your intention for the day. My intention today was to give a presentation that was so good, it changes the trajectory in a, of one person's life in a positive way, even if it's just one person. That was my goal for today. So hopefully in another 45 minutes, I will have accomplished my goal. And then your three most important things. This is what is most commonly misused in the journal if somebody doesn't attend one of these workshops. The three most important things are not your daily to-do list. These must align with your three 90-day goals that you set. Your to-do list is that next section. It's your day at a glance. Most lists, to-do lists, don't get to done because we don't actually give ourselves time in the day to accomplish our tasks. And there is nothing more discouraging then copying something from a task list from one day to the next over and over again and turning that page. So give yourself time in the day to give those to-dos done. And another pro tip here, anything that takes two minutes or less, don't even write it down, just do it in the moment. Science shows it takes more time to come back to that email or voicemail or task than it is just to do it in the moment. Two minutes or less, just do it now. 
anything more, including your email, I would actually put in your calendar. And then on the top right page, you'll see there's four little boxes, your 10, 10, 10, morning routine, evening routine, track your habits. That is a little biohack to give you dopamine to reinforce you creating these healthy habits. Underneath that in that block, you're going to have a journaling prompt. So if you can't think of something to journal about today, journal about the question that's asked in that little blue line right there. And the goal of that is to help keep you on your path. And then the one thing that personally drove me crazy about all the other structured journals out there is I had to carry another journal for my daily notes, my tasks, uh, you know, meeting notes, et cetera. So the right-hand page is blank. You can use it for your daily journaling. You can use it for uh, doodling, brainstorming, whatever it is. And then again, the back of the journal has those 60 blank pages for all of the work that you need to do. I want to share with you a quick video on the power of gratitude now. Do you think this is just another day in your life? It's not just another day. It's the one day that is given to you. Today. It's a gift. It's the only gift that you have right now. And the only appropriate response is gratefulness. If you learn to respond as if it were the first day in your life and the very last day, then you will have spent this day very well. Begin by opening your eyes and be surprised that you have eyes you can open. That incredible array of colors that is constantly offered to us for pure enjoyment. Look at the sky. We so rarely look at the sky. We so rarely note how different it is from moment to moment with clouds coming and going. Open your eyes, look at that. Look at the faces of people whom you meet. Each one has an incredible story behind their face. Not only their own story, but the story of their ancestors. All that life from generations and from so many places all over the world flows together and meets you here. Life-giving water if you only open your heart and drink. Open your heart to the incredible gifts that civilization gives to us. If you flip a switch and there is electric light, Turn a faucet and there's warm water and cold water and drinkable water. A gift that millions and millions in the world will never experience. And so I wish you that you will open your heart to all these blessings and let them flow through you. 
that everyone whom you will meet on this day will be blessed by you. Just by your presence. Let the gratefulness overflow into blessing all around you. And then it will really be a good day. That last saying really resonates with me. Let the gratefulness overflow into blessing all around you. Um, I don't know about you, but I have met some of the most miserable people in the world that are billionaires and some of the happiest people in the world and some of the most impoverished places that I've visited all over the world. And the difference is gratefulness. Now, why is that most important things so important? Those three tasks, those are not just daily busy work, but they have to be making incremental progress towards the 90 day goals that you set. The best example of this was actually the expedition for the South Pole, two expeditions for the South Pole. The first was led by Raoul Amundsen, who was a Norwegian gentleman. And the second expedition was led by a British man named Robert Falcon Scott. They had the same equipment, they had the same training, the same number of people. They set out at the same time to reach their goal of the South Pole. But the Norwegians had the mantra of the 20 mile march. No matter what the conditions were like, they would pack up base camp and they would try to make 20 mile progress towards their goal of the South Pole. Many days they made it less than a mile, but every single day they made progress. The British expedition had a different mindset. When conditions weren't ideal, they would hunker down and try to wait out the storm. And then when circumstances were perfect, make up for lost time. You can probably imagine how this story ends. The Norwegians reached the South Pole three and a half weeks before the British. The British expedition perished on the return. They did not survive this expedition. For all those people, it was a matter of life and death. For everybody on this call, it is a matter of life and death. Today is a gift. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. Your life is a one in 400 trillion gift. So what are you going to do today to be the best version of yourself? Another great tragedy of humankind is that it is much easier to disappoint ourselves than it is to disappoint somebody else. If my goal this morning was just to go for a run, I might have stayed in bed since I haven't slept very much in the last week. But because I've committed to my friend, Susan, and I wanted to present to her company, I am accountable to her. So I am, hell yes, I'm gonna show up and get out of bed and make sure I'm here. I'm already drank an entire pot of coffee to make sure I'm present. I'm here, I won't let my friend down. The same if you wanted to go for a run or if you were going to go play squash with a friend. You might not get out of bed for a run, but if you committed to somebody else, you're going to show up for them. So for the next 30 days, I want you to all find accountability partners and to help do the best version of yourself. And what you're going to do is with your accountability partner, just take a photo of your day page. What are the three things you're grateful for? What's your vision for the day? And what's your three most important things that you're going to accomplish? And just take a photo on your cell phone and text that to your accountability partner. An accountability partner, when you get that photo in the morning, don't use it as a prompt to, oh crap, I haven't done my oak journal. If you haven't, yes, do that, but also go one step further and read the things that your partner is grateful for. Read their most important tasks. Synchronicity is at play all of the time in the world and most of us just walk past it asleep. So if you actually read what that person is grateful for, read what their most important tasks are, so many times there's ways that you could pitch in and help with encouragement or something else that's gonna help them reach those goals. So pick somebody that's gonna be your accountability partner that cannot be your life partner. If you wanna lose weight, the last thing you want is your husband telling you maybe you shouldn't have that cheesecake at night. So again, like the passive aggressive, you know, making the bed thing. So choose somebody, a best friend, someone else. If you want to be a masochist, I will be your accountability partner for the next 30 <laughs> days. But choose somebody that you're going to do this with and then commit to doing that. That will get you on this path and you will crush the next 30 days. And that will roll into 90 days, will roll into a year, into a decade, and then the rest of your life. And then at the end of every single week, so after day seven of week one, after day seven of week two, every single week we have a retrospective which I are indeed from uh, Agile Software Development, R&D standing for rip off and duplicate. And Agile Software Development, <clears throat> at the end of every sprint, 
they look back to see what held them back, what pushed them forward, and what confused them. So I want you to do the same. I mentioned in the beginning, writing something down doubles your probability of accomplishing it. You're going to write down your goals 14 times because at the end of every week, you're going to just put a quick synapse and progress made. Just two or three words for each goal, and then you're going to shade in the percent complete you are to that goal. This gives you a visual cue as to how you're tracking. Do not treat your 90-day goals like your college master's thesis and wait till the last week to try to do all the work. That does not work. This percent complete is going to inform the strategic planning this next block. So depending on where you are, like I've got a lot of work left to do on my book. So my strategic planning for this next week should be a lot of time that I'm allocating for whether it's research, writing, editing, even the design layout. And then the last two things every week, which are essential, are the habit tracker and the reflection. What gets tracked gets done. So if you want to do 10, 10, 10, if you want to do that lemon water to start your day, state your goal and then check off every day if you complete it or not and be honest with yourself. OK, and then the next chunk, the reflection, the personal reflection, this little tiny block, please do not overlook it. It is truly a game changer. One of the results that I'm most proud of from the journal is actually a woman here in Colorado that works at a library. Her name is Jennifer, and she she didn't want to change the world. She didn't want to start a business. She just wanted to be better. And when she was doing her reflection, she realized she was frequently disappointing her daughter because Jennifer was severely overweight. And she tried many diets over her life, but nothing had stuck with her. But when every week she kept seeing that she was physically, you know, feeling a two or a three, that she couldn't do a four minute, you know, YouTube dance with her daughter, things shifted. And she's lost over 120 pounds. And Susan, she actually read it, her bucket list and sent it to me because she said, I can now do things in this life I never thought I'd be able to accomplish. Literally makes me want to cry. So don't overlook this reflection, but you have to keep real score. Don't BS yourself. There's a lot of things that happen with your subconscious. If you're honest with yourself, you're going to make these changes because you're keeping real score. All right, 3210 email. This is an email hack that I do. I don't know if it's going to work in your world. It doesn't work for cardiothoracic surgeons. I just presented for Andrea with all her hotel people and, and planners, and it doesn't work for them either because they are constantly tethered to their phone in reacting to clients. I am not. So I do my email for 30 minutes, twice a day. I read every email only once, and I get my inbox down to zero. Having your inbox as a to-do list is very, very, very unproductive. Once you read an email, don't uncheck it as unread. You've read that email. Either respond in real time, delete it, delegate it. If you can unsubscribe, unsubscribe. Or if it is something like, let's say it's a, Susan, you're communicating with Adventure Nannies and Shenandoah has a proposal for something that's going to take you an hour to respond to. That's where that day at a glance comes in. Give yourself the time to do this work. Most of you probably have a ton of emails sitting in your inbox, spam, junk, unread. You're not going to get to them when you want to. Give yourself time to do it. 3210 email. Now, like I mentioned in the beginning, one of my favorite sayings, if we have facts, we use facts. If we have opinions, we'll just use mine. This is not based on my opinion. This is based on the neuroscience of these four chemicals in your brain, serotonin, oxytocin, dopamine, and cortisol. Serotonin is the feeling of joy, confidence, and inspiration. Oxytocin is love. Dopamine is winning and rewards. And cortisol is fear, anger, and anxiety. Cortisol was great at our ancestors staying alive. If the grass ruffled in the, the jungle, your ancestor thought that might be a saber-toothed tiger. Cortisol flooded their body. Adrenaline flooded their body. Their pupils dilated. They could run further and faster because they thought they were in a life or death situation. Unfortunately, our brain chemistry has not evolved as fast as our culture, our society, our cities. So you get that same rush of cortisol that your ancestor got when he thought a dinosaur was going to eat him when you're stuck in rush hour traffic. But it is not a life or death situation. Most people in today's society live in an elevated state of dopamine and cortisol. And you can be a very high performer in this state, but you will burn out and it is not healthy. We need to get your cortisol down and we need to get your serotonin and your oxytocin up. The cool thing about the tool you have in your hand, this roadmap that's going to help you be the best version of yourself and serve as a compass to keep you on that path has hacks in it. So when you do your morning gratitude, it's increasing your serotonin. When you do your morning meditation, the 10, 10, 10, it's reducing your cortisol and increasing your oxytocin. 
So within the tools that you have in you, this is automatically going to be happening. There's an exceptional talk by another EOer, Mike Simonson out of EO San Francisco, that has a book called Hacking Happiness. He actually did a test, uh, I think it's been five years ago now, where he stopped measuring sales goals, financial goals. He started measuring his company in his employees' serotonin. And he didn't tell them he was doing this, but he was very, very intentional with their serotonin. And the results after one year of shifting from serotonin versus sales goals were astronomical. The profits in his company were through the roof. So think about these four chemicals and let's get your cortisol down. Uh, is anybody familiar with my, my crazy Dutch friend Wim Hof here? Susan, anybody else? I can only see a couple of people. Wim is an amazing Dutch gentleman that actually after a tragedy, he lost his, uh, his partner to a suicide. He developed the Wim Hof method. The Wim Hof method is three components. One, an ancient Tibetan breath work, two, meditation, and three, exposure to cold. The breath work does two things. It's a deep inhalation and hard exhalation. And you do a cycle of 30, and then you hold your breath as long as you can. What that's doing is actually increasing the oxygen in your blood, and it is shutting down your body's receptors to uh, feeling that cold, to feeling pain. So breathing. Next is the meditation that gets you in the state, and then the exposure to cold. Exposure to cold is exceptional for you. <clears throat> the comfort crisis that we currently live in, this perfectly air conditioned in 72 degrees um, society is not actually good for our health. It was only 100 years ago, you were putting your baby in a cold stream and bathing it. We have gotten soft in today's society. So pushing yourself that exposure to cold is exceptional. Wim has shown us that we can actually become superhuman. This gentleman holds multiple world records for things like swimming the longest distance under ice in a frozen lake. He runs marathons in the Sahara Desert without drinking water. And he also doesn't get sick. And they've done studies on Wim where he'll teach a group of people. He could take you know, this entire group, teach you Wim Hof, and then a control group, inject you with influenza, and you will not get sick. It is truly incredible. If you feel nervous in exposing yourself to cold, getting out and making snow angels in snow or something like that, um, you can start uh, easy. Start with a cold shower. But when you do this for the first time, don't do your Wim Hof breath work standing up. Actually, please sit down in the shower because it is hyperventilating and I don't want anybody to fall down and hurt themselves. So you would sit down in the shower, do three cycles of that breath work, and then turn the water all the way cold and just stay in there for one minute. It is a game changer for you. If that's terrifying to you, you can literally just do a bowl of ice water and put your hand in it, but get out of your comfort zone. Doing something that makes you uncomfortable is an exceptional way to continue to grow. And then at the end of every week, we've got some positive psychology exercises. We're going to do one together now, but these are right after those retrospectives that you do um, each week. So don't skip over these. It's not meant to, you know, you don't always have to do it Sunday at 5 p.m. You could do it any time throughout the week, but these serve as your compass to help keep you on your path. And the first exercise we're going to do is called the four sevens. So turn back to the back of your journal where you wrote that start stop list or flip over the page that you did your start stop listed on. And we're going to do the four sevens. The first seven is seven years. I want you to imagine that you just left your doctor's office and it was not a good visit. Your doctor told you that seven years from today, December, 20, December 7th, 2029, will be your last day on earth. You can't change this. With that knowledge, I want you to write a quick bullet list of what you still want to accomplish in this life, knowing that you only had seven years left on earth. Go ahead and write it down now.
Okay, and once you've done that, the second seven gets a lot harder real fast. <clears throat> the second seven is you left that same doctor's appointment, <clears throat> but instead of being told you had seven years left in this life, you were told you had seven months left. Now, how does that shift? Two more. The third seven continues to get harder. Now that doctor told you it's seven weeks. You have seven weeks left. Now how does that list change? savvy group on this call so you can probably guess where this is going the fourth seven is seven days if you had one precious week left on earth how would you spend those seven days The purpose of this exercise, this was actually a tool that was developed by hospice care providers, people who have chosen to help others transition from this life to whatever's next. And the lesson that those hospice care providers learned was 
it was never the new car or the bigger boat or the bigger house that people regretted on their deathbed. It was the experiences, it was the relationships, it was the time with those that loved you. So many of you would have written things like uh, seven years, write a best-selling novel, have an exit from a business, things that are uh, legacy or ego-driven. But as you get down from seven months, seven weeks to seven days, when you get to seven days, the things that really matter in life come into focus really clearly. I would make love with a partner every night. I would have breakfast with my children every single morning. I would watch the sunrise. The things that most of us overlook every day, tragically, because we're chasing those ego-driven goals. So the purpose of the four sevens is to help give you the clarity into what really matters in life while we still have decades and decades and decades to live that best life. The next exercise is also from the gentleman, Warren Rustan, that Susan and I have been so fondly speaking of which is not the guy in the photo. I should replace this because Warren was at uh, Machu Picchu with me. Uh, that's George Gahn, who's another EO legend. But Warren has a bucket list that he wrote when he was 13 years old. And I don't know if you remember this, Susan, but he carries it around in a plastic bag, a Ziploc bag, like an artifact from Raiders of the Lost Ark. But this bucket list that he wrote over half a century ago had 100 items on it. And he has accomplished 98 of the 100 things that Warren wrote out to do. He has done enormous things. Like he played in the NBA. He worked for multiple presidents in the White House, the business accomplishments, the family achievements that he has um, been able to accomplish in this life are no small feat. The only two things that Warren hasn't done is see every country in the world, which kind of keeps changing on him, right? Countries are evolving. And then be president of the United States. And there absolutely are. In fact, I know... Uh, Keith Fiscus in your chapter has a Rustan 2024 uh, presidential shirt. So still holding my breath on that one. But take the time to write out your bucket list. If you don't have one physically written out, remember by writing it down, it doubles the probability of accomplishing it. And then once you've written your bucket list down, I want you to take the one item that you're going to accomplish in the next year and write it on a three by five index card. And take that index card and tape it to the mirror in your bathroom. And I want you to remember that, that stock photo of the woman looking at her phone with the blue light. And we talked about your subconscious being a sponge the first 10 minutes after you wake up and the last 10 minutes before you fall asleep. So we're going to do a little neuro hack and we're going to put that bucket list item in your subconscious to start and end every single day to make sure it happens within the next year. And which I'll end with this and we'll open up to questions. One of my favorite quotes, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time was today. I'm going to open it up for questions and see how I can help any of you. Let me stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for listening. How? What questions popped up? Is there anything in the chat? Does anybody have any questions I, about any of the techniques? I have a question. Thank you so much, Keith. Um, <clears throat> sorry. So you know how you have like, so you wake up at four and you do your meditation. So you're saying that the time, like doing the meditation before the exercise is more important because you're coming out of those deep sleep, the, the different waves, the Delta, the gamma, <clears throat> all of that. Like, does it matter the order, I guess, is what I'm asking. I actually do my creative writing before I do my 10, 10, 10. And that's the, the the window there is four to five in the morning. That's where you're naturally in those, that magical alpha and theta brain waves. If you have, and that's a really, really uh, exceptional question, Renee, if you've got a healthy routine that you always do, hey, I wake up and first thing I go to the gym or I go for a run or I go surf for an hour. I don't want you to change that routine. I want you to figure out how you can add 10, 10, 10. It doesn't have to be first thing when you wake up in the morning. Um, it's actually the second thing I do after writing but it does need to be in the morning. You know, the morning. we want to do that okay. at some part in the day. But what I don't want to do is change the healthy habits that you've already created. How are you going to work this into the routine that you already have? Okay, thank you. Yeah, because I found that I've tried reading before the exercise and I'm so tired. Like the, the workout gives me energy to do the other things. Yep. But what you were saying about that magical hour, if you, you know, I'm willing to try that just to change it because I know when you're coming out of that 
sleepy time, you know, that is where you're most creative. So I wouldn't want to miss that block either. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, um, what, so you're what time do you normally get up to wait to work out? Do you get up at four? Um, I, well, I used to, but no, I haven't in a long time. So it's more like six, six thirty is the window. Yeah. Um, I would, if you wake up six, six thirty, I would still would do your workout and then do your 10, 10, 10. If you want to okay. test biohack and do something creative, you want to work on a book or something or a painting, then do that in that four to five. In a lot of five, okay. also did it, you know, Michael Jordan famously had the 4am club where, you know, him, Scotty, and a lot of the bulls would wake up and they would get down there at four before, um, and then go do their, their actual day. So it was a, a bonus, but I, I like using it for the creative versus the physical. Okay. Thank you. That helps. What other questions could I answer for anybody? Can I just ask about just to follow up on, on, on Renee's? So are you setting up your alarm clock for four o'clock? <laughs> it's probably yeah. a stupid question, but <laughs> so you're, you're not naturally waking up at four. Um, I set my alarm clock, but probably 60% of the days I wake up about two minutes before your alarm. Um, so okay. once you've gotten in that habit, it, it becomes very, very mm. easy to do. Similar with meditation, people struggle when they first start, <laughs> you know, hey, I want to meditate for 10 minutes and they're constantly waking up, you know, opening their eye and looking at the clock. After you've done that for a few weeks, mm. you're just going to be in that zone and your body naturally knows, hey, I'm at, you know, I'm at that mm. 10 minutes. Um, if I'm working on something, a hack to get into the flow state, um, say it's one in the afternoon and I want to work on, on my book, or I'm working on a painting or even a, a project, right? Um, the secret there is turn off all your distractions. That means phone and mm -hmm. airplane mode, not even on vibrate, turn off all your social media, turn off your email. And I'm a big fan of, I use an hourglass to keep time. And the reason I do mm -hmm. that instead of setting an alarm is if I get in the flow state, and all of a sudden, after 30 minutes, my alarm goes off, it's over, right? I'm done uh, being in mm. that state of focus. But if the sand's running out of the hourglass and I don't see it, I might work for another hour in that laser state of focus without being distracted mm. before I realize it. Mm -hmm. And then the 10, 10, 10, are you having uh, alarm set up that you really just really strictly keep to the 10 minutes? No, I do 30, 30, 10. So I read okay. two chapters. So I usually read mm. a spiritual and then either a, a self-help or mm. a fiction book in the morning. And I'll just read mm. two chapters. Sometimes it's 20 mm. minutes. Sometimes if they're long chapters, mm. it'll be 40 minutes. Um, then I do, that's, I'm mm. sorry, that's after my meditation. I meditate for between 20 and 30 minutes. And then journaling is the only mm. thing I do for 10 minutes. So I guess for somebody to create a new healthy habit, I guess it is good to keep to keep a probably a, a timer or something to to yes. to get started until mm -hmm. you okay. get in that group cool. yeah yes. and then oh, somebody cool. Thank uh, you. Kat asked how do i keep a social life if i go to bed between 8 and 9 p.m um all right a few hacks there i set my alarm uh, at 9 30 is when i'm starting to go to bed i usually get in bed and between 9 45 and 9 50 every night I also make sure there are no screens on in my house after 9 p.m. Um, I use the Aura Ring. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that or how many of you wear a device, but I track my REM sleep, deep sleep, and light sleep every single night. So I spend usually seven hours in bed, but I get deep, deep sleep and REM sleep every night because I am absolutely exhausted. And because I've not been watching television or reading CNN or looking at Instagram at night, I go to bed within two to three minutes, I fall asleep. Uh, and these were habits that I've worked on for years and years and years to develop. And they'll, everybody has the, the ability to do this. So I definitely do have a social night, social life. I also have a monthly poker game where we play poker at my house till like two in the morning, one Friday. And you just, the next morning I get enough sleep. I sleep in till seven or eight at, at right. There's another two X rule that I'll teach you. And that is if you're trying to create a healthy habit or break an unhealthy habit and you, let's say you want to work out every morning. And this morning, you, you know, we, we had this uh, workshop and you weren't able to go to the gym. That does not mean that this, this is just out, throw it out the window. I'm off my, my goal. That means that tomorrow it is essential that you don't miss it. Do not go two consecutive days, either reinforcing or breaking a habit you wanna do. So that's the other two X rule. 
It's okay. Be kind to yourselves. Nobody's perfect. I created the Oak Journal six years ago. I don't think I've done a single quarter where I didn't miss at least two or three days, right? Life happens, travel, et cetera. I still have my gratitude in my mind, but I'm not perfect. You know, nobody is infallible. So just be kind to yourself and don't miss two days of what you're trying to do. Isn't it true? Like, so if you tell your brain the night before, I need to wake up at six o'clock, like I started doing this and it actually worked for me. I don't know if it works for everybody, but if you tell your brain, I need to be up at X time, it will wake up. It is amazing how that works. Yeah. But do you find that that's true for everybody? Uh, you know what? A lot of people, I, I can't say for everybody. I know it's true for me and I know it's true for most people. There are a few people that um, are resistant to this. Some people think that, hey, I do my best work at night. Uh, I'm a night owl. And I think it was, it wasn't Tupac, but there was one rapper that had a saying that I used to think all the baller shit happened at two in the morning. And then I realized it really happens at 5 a.m. So, <laughs> you know, you're really lying to yourself. What happens if you think, hey, I, I do my best work at night. And I used to do this at the agency. You'd actually procrastinate doing something until that last minute, sort of like your college thesis. And then you are forced to do that work with adrenaline. You stay up and you're able to accomplish it. But I guarantee you, it's not your best work. Mm. And as Thank far you. as, med oh, sorry. Go ahead, Renee. I was just going to ask about meditation. You were going to, were you going to bring us through one that you do or do you I'll, have? I'll tell you about transcendental meditation. So most people struggle with meditation because whether it's contemplative, concentrative, or they're doing a guided meditation, thoughts enter their mind and thoughts enter everybody's mind. So I practice transcendental meditation, which is a mantra based meditation. Uh, if you Google TM mantras, you will see what your mantra is. Mine is Shah Rain. The one thing I don't like about transcendental meditation is there's an organization that charges $2,000 to learn this technique. TM is the most frequently studied form of meditation when they do scientific studies on the benefit. My favorite study that they did, 200 practitioners of TM in the 70s told the mayor of Washington, D.C., we are going to lower the crime rate in July. And the, the mayor said, only if hell freezes over. And these 200 people went to D.C. every day for two hours. They meditated in the park. And their meditation actually changed the vibration of everybody around them. And that is the lowest crime rate on record in Washington, D.C. Even not with other people practicing meditation, that change in vibration impacted the community. That is why I frequently break my vow to TM and teach it to other people. When you learn it from TM.org, they charge you $2,000 and you take this vow that you're not going to teach anybody else, which I think is BS. If more people learned this, then the whole vibration of the world would change and it would elevate our global consciousness. So I'm quite happy to break my vow and teach you. Um, Google your TM much. Mine is Shah Rain. Depending on the age that you are, when you learn TM, that will dictate the mantra that you have. The word is actually, um, it does have a meaning, but you don't need to know the meaning of it. The word could be ice cream. To do TM, you'll sit uh, in a good posture and close your eyes, take three deep breaths. And if the mantra hasn't entered your mind, you start thinking the mantra. What happens when you think that mantra is eventually you get to this transcended state where your mind is at peace with itself. That's the, the, the word transcendental. You're not having any thoughts. And it's an incredibly euphoric state to be in when you're not thinking about the proposal you have to write or the mortgage you have to pay or any other challenges that you're facing. And you're in that state for between half a second to 30 seconds, and inevitably thoughts enter your mind. So it's almost like an EKG. You get to that transcended state, you think about that proposal, it pulls you out, and then all you have to do when you're doing TM is remember, oh, that's right, cat, you're meditating. Go back to your meditation. So Sharan, 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 you get back to that transcended state, and your meditation almost looks like an EKG where you're having thoughts going back to your TM state, having thoughts going back to that state, and you just practice that. Meditation is not a silver bullet that you're going to do once and be fixed. Think about it like your nervous system is a rubber band that's been twisted into knots your entire life, and each meditation is one untwisting of that rubber band. So it is a practice you're going to need to continue forever, but I promise you it will change your life. 
And then after you have your uh, 15, 20 minutes, 10 minutes, then you just stop taking the mantra. Uh, don't set an alarm. It's really jarring if you're doing TM to have some you know, really loud alarm um, come up, maybe like a trend, uh, Tibetan singing bowls or something like that. You can use an alarm, but you don't want to be jarred out of your meditation. Um, yeah. And then and the other thing with, with TM is you can't do it wrong. As long as you practice, you are doing it right. If you fall asleep, it meant that your body was tired and you needed rest. If your ear itches, it means you're supposed to scratch it. You don't need to mindfully, you know, make that itch disappear. You cannot do it wrong as long as you just do the practice. Well, thank you, Keith. I, I just wanted to say thanks again. This is really awesome. I can't wait to review um, and get my oak journal. But I um, I wanted to ask about your um, if you could review the three two one zero email again, just to kind of I, I would love to hear yeah. that again. And also, I know you you gave us a couple of tips like having an accountability partner, but. I think that that's really where the rubber meets the road for a lot of us is like sticking with it and the character of, you know, when it's not exciting anymore, we're still getting up in the morning and doing the thing. <laughs> and so, you know, kind of, if you have any personal experience there, what do you feel like helped you the most to stick with these things and really develop the habits? Um, commitment to yourself, fanatical discipline. So that's why that quote, I mean, when you open your oak journal, that character is the ability to carry up good resolution long after the excitement of the moment is passed is the first page of the Oak Journal. Because when the alarm goes off at four in the morning, I'm usually pretty tired, but that's when I ask myself that question, do you have character? And I guarantee you, everybody on this call, you have character in abundance. So for me, that was a game changer, but then the accountability partner helps you stay on that track. That's that little human hack that letting somebody else down versus just letting yourself down. And then that two X rule, you know, be kind to yourself, most people's New Year's resolutions will be broken by the end of January. Somebody wants to lose weight, January 15th, they go out to a big dinner, they overindulge, and then they think to themselves, well, it's over. I'm just going to throw my New Year's resolution out the window. It is not over. You are human. Just don't do it the next day. The next day, you have to be on point. So that that 2X rule for making or breaking healthier ha um, positive habits are, are really essential. And then do those exercises, you know, stay every week at the end of the journal, there's a different positive psychology exercise. And the point of that is to keep, keep you on that path and serve as a compass to keep you motivated and engaged. So you don't lose enthusiasm. And then the other thing I would say is, you know, Susan has my, my contact info. If you need additional help after this, then you reach out to me and say, hey, I'm struggling with, you know, X, what would you do to accomplish this or you know, overcome this? Yeah, I would love to um, kind of like, hear from your experience how larger groups like we're 50 people and we cannot meet each day and like tap each other on the shoulders and hey you know how's that thing going you know so the the peer group accountability you know what have you seen that worked that you know when when people want to do it so they can find each other because this is not a process that comes top down. You know, it's not me going to you and like, hey, did you do this job, right? Because it's you, your own personal commitment to yourself, what you want to achieve in your life to live the most happy, most productive, most joyful life, whatever your dreams are, um, that you want that for you. And it's not me, Susan, as your boss, holding you accountable unless you ask me to, right? So maybe Keith, you can maybe share a little bit on how you see in this work and larger groups and how people get started and then holding each other accountable because people that have not been on this call probably don't know what you know they need to need to do to hold, for instance, me accountable, right? But we could do it for each other, like cross department. So it's not like this boss employee, or it could be boss yeah. employee, manager employee, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah, so uh, three things there, Susan. One, um, the accountability partners. And when you're accountability partner, everyone is an equal. So if, if Susan's your accountability partner, you don't look at her as your employer, you look at her as your accountability partner, you are as much helping her as she is helping you. So one of my other favorite sayings is you can judge a man by how he treats someone that can do nothing for him. 
So how are you going to treat everybody? You know, the, the server at the restaurant today, the person that's checking you out at the gas station, how do you treat every single human? The second is there are two types of people on this call. Some of you are going to take something away from this that's going to actually change your life in a positive way. And then there are some people on this call that after this call, they're not going to do their journal and they're just sort of, eh, you know, that was interesting, but I'm not opting in for this. So choose which person you're going to be. Are you going to change your life today? Or are you going to stay on the current trajectory you're on? And if you're one of the first, if you want to change your life today and be the best version of yourself, an organization the size of this, I would recommend a voluntary WhatsApp channel or some other way that you communicate. I don't know if this group uses WhatsApp or Slack. I'm not right. going to advocate the technology. Use whatever tech you use. Don't add a new tool that's not within your ecosystem, but have a voluntary tool where you can all chime in. We, we have a WhatsApp group that's six years old from our EMP class, where we're still constantly re-encouraging others, um, sharing when we have something tragic and supporting each other. So have that community to help you accomplish the goals and be very vulnerable with what you're doing. If you're struggling with something, be honest with that struggle because that's going to help you um, actually overcome that challenge that you're facing. So I love the idea of that WhatsApp challenge, WhatsApp group channel where you can just, you know, be chiming in. Hey, did everybody do my, your, your journal this morning? Here's the results I had three days in. Oh my gosh, what happened? You know, after 90 days, I accomplished all three of my goals. I did this one after, you know, two weeks and set a second one. So have that community that's going to help you accomplish as a group. Real quick, everybody smile. I'm taking a picture. Oh, thank you, Renee. Camera. Cheese. Smile. Cheese. Okay, got it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Wonderful. Any are there any other questions before we wrap up? Are you free and made? You want to come out surfing? <laughs> I I think I've got something in California, uh, and I'll let you know the next talk out there because Susan, I didn't get to see you when I was presenting the Orange County chapter. Yes, so I was got... with my team in San Diego with Shenandoah at the Nanny Conference. Oh, I love Shenandoah. Awesome. Uh, she's amazing. I, I've got a, a, a presentation in January in LA North, so I'll spend some extra time and come down. Oh, yes, please. Um, come stay with me. Wonderful. Well, yeah, everybody. I think Keith and I were going to be a little bit scared on January 9th when we're both together in New York doing the stand up comedy at the South, what is it? The not South, the Carolinas. Airlines, yeah. Biggest comedy club in the world. Yeah. And does, does the group know that you're doing that, Susan? No, but you can tell them what we're doing. Yeah, yeah so um, Susan signed up to do stand-up comedy. So she is working with me and my coach, and there's going to be four or five of us that are doing stand-up on January 9th. And uh, we actually, this is going to be broadcast live, so there'll be, it'll be like a Netflix thing. You can watch it even if you're not in New York City. Uh, but I would love to see you all in New York because it is incredibly fun. And your um, fearless leader is going to get on stage and do her 15 minutes of stand up, which is I'm super excited. And I've talked to our coach and he loves your set. So, really, really excited. I, I think we have class tonight. So, I'm going to hear it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So, well, everybody, you. if you can just open the chat and just put a couple of you know, appreciation words towards uh, Keith, check off your box that you've done appreciation today. Uh, that would be amazing. Um, you can also unmute yourself and just say a few words, um, what you took out of it, because I think this is so important in a Zoom environment to actually hear from the people and say, you know, your name, what city you're in and what, it, what you took out very quick. Hi, my name is Virginia. Um, I'm, I live in Philadelphia and um, this was very eye-opening. I feel like I can start my day now um, in, in a great way. I have two small kids that are under two years old. So I feel like I, I like to make excuses for myself to not have enough time. And I think if I just got up a few hours earlier or you know really committed to something, I could really improve my everyday. So I really thank you for that. Hi, I'm Debbie. I'm from New Jersey. I have three grown children and we're going to be on vacation together in a few months. And 
I really want to order Oak Journals for everyone and have them all watch the video and pay it forward. And I love the manifestation aspects of everything you're talking about. And it's really could be life altering. So thank you. Thank you very much. Use if you do order any Oak Journals, use code EO. It's very easy to remember. And that's the biggest discount that we have running unless there's like a crazy sale that saves 20% off anything you purchase forever. Um, thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Katarina from Texas. And um, I just want to say my husband loves doing yoga. So we already do yoga every day. <laughs> but um just making sure that you're setting intentional goals for yourself and following through with them. I think I, I same as Virginia, like to make excuses for myself or say I'm too tired or I can't do this. And so, you know, really pushing yourself to do things, even when they're out of your comfort zone or you feel like you don't want to do them, that's when it's the most important to do them. So having someone tell you that again is really important, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Victoria. I'm in Nevada. And um, I think it's so easy to focus every day on like the struggles and the things that you didn't do or you cannot do. So I'm really excited to shift that to focus more on the gratitude. So thank you for that. I also want to say I love the idea of putting negative thoughts on a piece of paper and then just burning them and just mm -hmm. getting rid of them. I, you know, I do write down negative thoughts that I have. And so, you know, thinking about burning them and just getting rid of that and opening space for positivity and things like that is, is a really cool suggestion. And I love that as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Keith. Also from my side, I'm in New York, so I can't wait to see you in January in Caroline's, you and Susan. And I just wanted to say, yeah, thank you very much. My father is a, uh, a Sikh and he gets up at 3 a.m. every night and he's been telling me to do that since four or five mm -hmm. years now and I refuse to do it because I love my sleep so uh, I think he will be very happy when he later hears that I will start getting up earlier to do the things he has been trying to tell me to do <laughs> so thank you from my father's side too I guess <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. It was an honor to be here. And again, Susan has my contact info. If anybody has any questions that they want to share offline that they didn't want to um, ask here, or if you know something comes up two weeks from now and, and you have a conundrum that you want to discuss, please feel free. Do not hesitate to reach out. Uh, like I mentioned, my life's purpose is to help others be the best version of themselves. So you all are helping me achieve my life's purpose. Oh, thank you thank so you much, so much. Keith. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank See you, you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Bye.